So yeah, I'm Sam. I'm the freshwater ecologist at Wild Fish, and my primary responsibility is supporting our uh, invertebrate monitoring program called Smart Rivers. In this talk, I'll give you guys a little bit of background about us and what we do, and a bit of an update on our species level monitoring program and the state of freshwater ecosystems in the UK at the moment. Wild Fish, if you don't already know, is a freshwater conservation charity, and our aim is to reverse the decline of freshwater fish populations and their habitats in the UK. And so our portfolio of work reflects this, and we have a range of ongoing projects, uh, including the impacts of water abstraction, as well as our Off the Table campaign, which is working up in Scotland, working to get open net farm salmon out of restaurants and to try and end the, the process. Importantly, we also focus a lot on water quality, and that includes our recent High Court action for trying to hold the Environment Agency and Offwater to account uh, for failing to deal with the current sewage crisis, and also our ongoing citizen science scheme, which many of you will be aware of, Smart Rivers. Uh, as a charity, we are evidence-led, and we use the law to address the causes and not the symptoms of the challenges facing our freshwater habitats. And a keystone to be able to do all of this work is the fact that we are completely unaligned. We don't accept any government money. Um, we're about wild fish first, not politics. I'm sure I don't need to explain to you guys why we need to protect wild fish and their habitats. We're in a profound time of ecological challenge and change. Um, I'm sure recently you might have seen the State of Nature report revealing that as many of one in six of our species in the UK are at risk of being lost. Alongside of this is a, a range of statistics, like the fact that 65% of flying insects declined between 2004 and 2021, and also that 75% of returning Atlantic salmon have decreased, the numbers have decreased in the last 25 years. And, and this is actually a very common trend worldwide, according to ZSL and WWF, uh, their Living Planet Index, the migratory freshwater fish are some of the most threatened animals on the planet. And in Europe, populations have declined by up to 93% between uh, 1970 and 2016. And so obviously, statistics like this are terrifying and sign really signify to us the need for profound changes in how we interact with nature. It's worth highlighting that freshwater biodiversity is declining at a faster rate than any other ecosystem. Our lives and society are dependent on freshwater. So it's unavoidable that we impact these incredible habitats in some way, be it through industry, through processes such as water abstraction or point pollution sources, or the way we physically change the structure of our waterways through things like weirs, or where we get huge amounts of diffuse uh, pollution runoff through agriculture, a water industry that's struggling to cope with our current population, or even our unintentional impacts. For example, if we went for a swim in a river with a sun cream with certain kind of chemicals that do a lot of ecological damage. Freshwater habitats are among the most biodiverse places on Earth. They cover less than 1% of the planet's surface, and yet they're home to almost a quarter of all vertebrate species, and that includes over half of the world's known fish species. In 2016, the Living Planet Report showed that populations of freshwater species dropped by 81% globally between uh, 1970 and 2012. And that's more than double the decline observed in terrestrial and marine systems. Globally, the majority of freshwater animals are invertebrates. And of this, about 60% are thought to be insects. And so these invertebrates are really a really important part of these habitats. They're a key component of the food webs. But in addition to this, they perform, uh, they perform many key ecological processes, such as nutrient cycling and the breaking down of detritus and leaf litter and other matter. And so because of this, changes to invertebrate diversity and abundance will alter the natural balance and ecological resilience of rivers. And this has massive implications for other species like the birds and fish. So we really need to know what's going on. Based on those terrifying statistics, and I'm sure if you guys have spent time in nature and observed what's going on in the news at the moment, it's clear that we need to be keeping a close eye on our rivers in the current ecological uh, climate. However, the Environment Agency's monitoring budget has continued to decline over the decades. And what this means is there's fewer boots, boots on the ground, checking on our river's health and keeping polluters in line. And it's important that we think about monitoring done by the EA, not self-interested uh, parties like water uh, companies. 
because this is key to a environmental protection regime. And if there's no monitoring going on, it means there's no evidence. And the, so the monitoring underpins the inspection enforcement needed to cut down on pollution. And without this monitoring, the problems disappear. Um, and so at the moment, we lack a coherent and comprehensive picture of the state of the freshwater environment in the UK and in England. And this is this is really concerning, as in 2019, only 14 percent of rivers were considered in good ecological health and all of our rivers were seen to be impacted by chemicals. And this is this is an assessment that's no longer done annually. And we have to wait for another two years for the next um, overall assessment. And that's when we know that the proportion of rivers in good ecological health in England were among the worst in Europe. And I'm sure, and another thing I don't need to tell you guys about is that the, we have these incredible chalk streams. Uh, England is home to 85% of the world's chalk streams and they're incredibly biodiverse. And they're sometimes referred to as the UK's rainforests, which I'm sure the people uh, fighting to protect our remaining patches of temperate rainforests aren't, aren't such a fan of, but they're also compared to coral reefs. But I think this is unfair again. And I think instead I might start re referring to the coral reefs as the, the chalk streams of the, the tropics to balance the plate a little bit. And so we have a global responsibility to protect these habitats. Invertebrates give a more representative picture of long-term water quality than things like spot water samples, because particularly you know, in rivers, water is always on the move. Uh, so unless you're in the right place at the right time to take a water sample, issues can be missed. The freshwater invertebrates that live in our rivers and streams, however, are there year round or depending on their life cycle, they might be there for weeks, months or even years. And so the, their communities are constantly exposed to the sometimes unseen pollution threats degrading our water quality. In these communities, individual invertebrate species have different sensitivities and tolerances to different kinds of pollution. And so they have something which we like to call a, a sensitivity fingerprint. When that's viewed alongside other species in the community, it can give us an indication of what threats a particular river is facing. And among these uh, invertebrates, a particularly important group are the river flies. Uh, so that's the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, which are orders of insects that are generally thought of as pollution sensitive. So generally, if you have higher numbers of these uh, groups of invertebrates, it's an indicator of higher water quality in your rivers. And so what we do from sample to score. We'll go out and we collect the invertebrates through a standardized three minute kick sample. We then pick out the species and the numbers of them from the sample and identify them using these incredible photographic resources we have with Smart Rivers. And then we look up the species in abundance against tolerance tables, and this calculates a water quality stress score. Species level is incredibly important because there's a lot of variation in amongst the, uh, the freshwater invertebrates we work with. The information invertebrates can tell us massively depends on what resolution they're identified to. So within a group, like I've just mentioned, like the mayflies, which are known to be pollution tolerant, if you go down to the species level, there are certain species like the southern iron blue, which are incredibly sensitive. You have species like the large dark olive, which are a bit more pollution tolerant. So it, it's really important to even within these sensitive groups to go down to the species level to get the fine detail. And we need this species level analysis to get a true assessment of the state of freshwater invertebrate populations and to get a true assessment of, of biodiversity. We created the Riverfly Census, which is a national survey completed by professional entomologists to look at what the invertebrates were saying about the state of our rivers. Initially, from for three years from 2015-17, involved 12 rivers, uh, where four to six sample sites in each river and they were sampled at spring and autumn with species identified species level. And this generated scores for chemical, phosphorus, sediment, organic enrichment and flow stress. And by recording species level and their abundances, we also provide, we also produced um, really important biodiversity records. The Riverfly census was repeated again in, in 2021 and compared to our original Riverfly uh, census, and this highlighted a lot of worrying scores. So, for example, we saw a loss on average of 41% of mayfly species uh, compared to our 1998 values on our chalk streams. Then our 2021 survey, there was a lower mean diversity of mayfly, stonefly and caddisfly species compared to the original riverfly census. 
And then other statistics like 47% of the autumn sites exhibited high, much higher chemical stress than in the original Riverfly census. You can see on that we, we managed to rank the scores by combining the stress levels of uh, the metrics I mentioned earlier. And we managed to rank our rivers and how they were doing. And you can see here a comparison of the 2015 to 17 scores versus the 2021 scores. And you can see the Itchen didn't rank particularly highly in 2015, 2017, and it ranked even lower in 2021. And at the same time, the test remained at the bottom end of these rankings in both surveys. And we also saw declines in things like uh, the Avon and the Dove. And so after the River Fly Census, uh, Smart Rivers were born, where we wanted to continue this really important work using volunteers, where the volunteers can monitor their rivers at the sites most important to them. And we can use this really strong species level data to uh, lobby the Environment Agency and other government agencies for greater pollution in our waterways. It's important to know that there are different levels to the invertebrate citizen science monitoring that goes on. There's different schemes. The Riverfly Partnership runs um, their monthly monitoring schemes where they can check for, they run family level identification to check for uh, gross pollution events. Whereas Smart Rivers, we run twice annual, so that's spring and autumn, high resolution species level where possible analysis. And this gives us these assessments that let, lets us look at chronic water pressures and biodiversity. Where we are now is if we go into the data, our 2022 National Smart Rivers Breakdown, we monitored 153 different sites in the spring season, while we also monitored 149 sites in our autumn season, and overall we monitored 55 rivers. And the graph below, you can see a breakdown of the number of invertebrates that we actually counted in 2022. And so in this breakdown, we found 268 different invertebrate species, of which we found 343,000 total invertebrates that we found. And you'll see on this graph, there's a large number of these invertebrates are in the miscellaneous taxonomic group, which happens that it's just our smart rivers grouping method. Um, but it's worth noting that 94% of these miscellaneous uh, insects were gamorous, which is a species that we expect to find in very high numbers. And overall, our, um, our surveys last year found that in spring, the uh, greatest stress facing our rivers is from sediment, whereas in autumn, the greatest stress was, was from chemicals. And what you see on the screen now is a breakdown of the combined uh, phosphate, sediment and chemical pressure scores across all the rivers that we monitored last year. And on the left are the rivers that overall were the least stressed and on the right goes down to the rivers on the most stressed but it's important to notice within this there's a lot of variation because obviously due to the nature of our sampling um some of the sites are in better quality and we use them to compare to sites say downstream of a pollution uh, input so that's why you see on these box plots these big ranges and that just reflects that within these rivers there are some areas that are doing better than others this brings us to the uh, the Watercress and Winterbourne Smart Rivers Hub. So now you guys and all your hard work, you've got seven seasons of data that cover nine sites. A lot of sites and a lot of data. So just due to the nature of the talk, this is a, a spotlight of some of your some of your sites and some interesting findings. Because you guys now have a couple of years worth of data from multiple sites, we can start to look at trends which is part of uh, what my role at Wildfish is going to be, is there's, there's this incredible database of Smart Rivers data spanning the whole country. And part of my role is going to be looking at annual changes nationally and locally and helping individual hubs kind of achieve their individual aims. Um, what you have here on these graphs are an assessment of our chemical organic enrichment phosphate and siltation metrics. And on the very left of the graphs, you can see a colored band, which goes from green to red. Green is good, dark red is bad. On the graphs themselves, you can see a black dot with error bars, which is the average change for the sites in the test catchment. And then behind that, you can see individual colored shapes, which represent your the individual sites on the test catchment. And so what, this, what these graphs are showing you is general changes since 2018, 2019. And within this, you can start to pick out individual sites and when in a particular year, 
some sites were particularly bad for certain stresses or if in general particular sites are bad for certain stresses and this can help us really target our aims in improving the water quality in these areas for example in spring you can see in 2021 and 2023 Paul Hampton uh, scored quite well for organic enrichment uh, equally in siltation in spring you can see sites like uh, Paul Hampton and KFC are slightly more impacted by sediment the same thing could be done in autumn and we we we, we expect to see slightly different pressures over the seasons generally we do see higher pressure in autumn and this can be due to things like lower flows over the summer and causing pollutants to uh, concentrate but you can see again uh, kfc and polhampton was tended to struggle in phosphates back in 2018 and 2021 but these kind of graphs allow us to really explore your data set and start to pick out uh, key culprits now if we move on to a couple of smaller case studies this is the spring data for the born rivulet you can see in general you can start to see the, the trajectory of the chemical pressures looked was looking on the trajectory is looking quite positive until um this year where there seems to be a, a reasonably sharp drop off at both sites so being able to have data sets like this makes it really interesting for me and wildfish to interact with your hub because we can start to have conversations about what might have changed between 2022 and 2023 that we can try and pin down what could be behind some of these shifts that we're seeing you can see here on the siltation graph in the middle both sites seem to struggle for siltation the most in 2021 and since there's been a, a positive trajectory and in general um, Haraway Bridge suffered from more siltation pressures than Ironbridge. The final graph on the screen is EPT abundance and that's the river fly species that's the species I talked about earlier the mayflies the caddisflies and stoneflies back to what we said I said a bit earlier about the importance of species and the numbers we need to know what species are in our rivers and in what numbers to know if we've got healthy functioning ecosystems. So it's really important that we look at abundance because there's no point just doing presence absence because if you had a single individual, you get to tick the box, but that's not necessarily reflective of health, a healthy invertebrate community. So you can see here from the, the Born Rivulet data that from 2019 to 2021, there was quite a big drop in the total abundance of these sensitive river fly species. But then this has been followed by so a massive spike in EPT abundance, which was actually mostly uh, canis and blue-winged olives. The year after, in 2023, these numbers have come straight back down. Whereas in Haraway Bridge, we can see since 2021, this seems to be keeping this positive trajectory of uh, increases to abundance. And we can start to break these invertebrates up into their individual smart rivers categories. You can see that the reason that the mayfly, the uh, riverfly species abundance is increasing at these sites is primarily down to increasing numbers of mayflies. If we look into these, the, we can look into the species. And uh, in 2022, Ironbridge, there was large numbers of blue-winged olives, but particularly large numbers of canis, which are small, the smallest mayfly species, and they live uh, in amongst the sediment. And so it's really interesting to try and understand these patterns as well because in 2022 there was nearly 2400 of these individuals and the year after we're not seeing anything like that in in terms of population numbers whereas Harrow bridge we're seeing just still still with the mayfly and again mostly the canis and blue-winged olives but we're seeing increasing numbers of these from year to year and it's particularly great with blue-winged olives because they're they're a really sensitive species so it's great to see increasing numbers of these on your rivers because that's not the case everywhere uh, and then we can move to the anthem, and this is the autumn data. And again, I've picked out chemicals just to show that overall, since 2018, particularly for sites like KFC, the chemical rating has kind of stayed the so same. There's been a bit of a drop and a slight increase again, but they're still slightly impacted by chemical pressure. Whereas you can see with Stana, there was a much compared to 2018, <clears throat> sorry, the chemical pressure has really increased into 2021 with a slight recovery afterwards. And this is also, you can see in the, the phosphate pressure, generally there's been a decline. So compared to 2018 in, in Stana, the values are uh, just considerably lower. Uh, whereas again, KFC has kind of dropped and then recovered slightly again. But interestingly, looking at the river fly species abundance, at KFC, we're seeing this kind of uh, quite a positive trajectory. So the numbers of the riverfly species we're finding are in, have been increasing with the years of sampling. That's not that's not the case at Stannis. So this is again 
where it's great for me to be able to interact with the hubs to try and figure out what's going on that's different between these sites. How come at one site we're seeing this annual increase in the numbers of invertebrates, whereas at your other site, it's just kind of trickling along the bottom, particularly as in some of the metrics stand out, performs KFC. So it's, it's really interesting to try and get to the bottom of, what, of, of what's going on here. Uh, you can see again with KFC, you've got increasing numbers of mayflies, particularly from 2021 to 2022. And the orange bar a bit higher up also shows much larger numbers of caddisfly. And then if you look across uh, the graph on the right, which is Stanner, are much, much lower numbers of these really sensitive riverfly species that we're looking for. Particularly in 2022, what we're finding with your sample, over half of the sample is gamorous and about a quarter of the sample are true flies. And true flies are generally thought of something that are more pollution tolerant. And certain species of true fly, and particularly the gamorous, their generation time means that they can capitalize on an environment. So if there are fewer invertebrates in an area due to something like a pollution incident, these are the species that can quickly recolonize and build up the numbers. So it's worth noting that huge numbers of invertebrates aren't always necessarily overall a positive thing. It can also be showing us that something's going on. Um, you know, maybe we shouldn't be seeing this numbers of true flies. Maybe that's actually a sign that there's a problem on this area of water. And then the final site I wanted to spotlight today is the Arl. Um, the main reason I picked this one out is, to, is due to the, the river fly species. There has been over the since you guys started monitoring, there has been a improvement from slightly impacted to unimpacted in terms of chemical stress. At the same time, there's been what seems to be a slight inc increase in uh, phosphate pressure. 2019 to 2021 with your river fly species, there was a slight drop. But since then, year to year, we've been, you've been finding more species of these sensitive river flies. And at the same time, you're seeing a massive increase in the abundance. And what's encouraging here compared to the site of the Bourne River that we looked at earlier is there's not been a big spike in the subsequent drop off. We're seeing a increase in your river fly abundance and then that's remaining higher than it used to be, which is which is quite an encouraging sign. And then this is the breakdown again for the invertebrates you, that you found. Um, I've plotted gamorous on a separate axis here just because there's quite a lot of them and otherwise it squashes everything else down and it can be quite hard to see. But if you focus on the left hand graph, um, you can see the increasing numbers of mayflies and reasonable numbers of caddisflies. Um, your mayflies, they're mainly betis, but particularly in 2023, we're seeing much more species diversity, which is really encouraging. And it's quite hard to see because the stonefly and the mollusk colors are very similar, but we're actually seeing over 2022 and 2023, an increase to the number of stoneflies, which is really great because across the board, stoneflies are really sensitive and quite a lot of the sites were really struggling to see the numbers that we used to with them. Um, so it's not only a small amount. Hopefully that's hopefully that's a good sign. Here at Wild Fish, what we really want to do is start to raise the bar. There are strategies out there that are aiming to improve chalk streams to protect river status like the te Itchin. But we feel that this bar needs to be raised for all cheap chalk streams as they're such important habitats and, you know, our wild fish populations really need them. And nationally, there's no focus because people are made to believe that the test and itching don't necessarily need help. Their historical prestige makes them seem like, you know, these amazing poster childs of chalk streams. What we want is for all chalk streams to be protected equally and to have active work going on them. Because what we don't want to be is in a situation where the bottom of the pile in terms of chalk streams are being picked up and recovered. And meanwhile, what used to be the top of the pile has massively declined while we've not been watching. And our current focus in regards to the chalk streams is to continue to fight to reduce abstraction from the chest niching, to ensure that the law on sewage is enforced now and not in the distant future, to take action on agricultural threats, and to continue to fill monitoring gaps with the help of our Smart Rivers Network and all your workers volunteers. Thank you very much for having me and I'd be happy to take any questions.